risen, that he literally turned a grave into a garden. Literally. Literally. The garden tomb is what it's called. He literally turned a grave into a garden. He brings the things that are dead alive. And I am example number one. I am example number one of somebody who was turned from dead to alive, from no purpose to all peace. So I ask you guys, please help us this morning. Please help us this morning. Share the feed. You never know who you could reach by simply sharing the feed. And for every single share that we have, we're going to give $5 to Cooperative Christian Ministries. As of Friday, we have 51 shares from our last Good Friday feed. So uh, that's $255. I'm praying that we can get 150 shares today. 150 shares. That would allow us to give $1,000 to CCM. How awesome would that be? So help us today. Help us today. Let me pray before we get into the message. Let me pray for you. I want to ask you a question before I get ready to pray. What do you do when you feel out of control? I feel like that if there's one thing that we've all realized in the midst of this COVID stuff, that we're not in control, that an invisible enemy is actually really alive. You know, we Christians have believed that for thousands of years. There's, a, there's an invisible enemy. Something that we can't see, something that we can't touch, something that we can't taste. And now the world has also seen that. And so we realize that we're not in control. So what do we do when we realize we're not in control? I want to talk about that. And I want to ask you that question. Like, what do you tangibly do when you feel out of control? If you would drop that in the comment box, do you, like me, like what I try to do when I feel out of control is I clean. <laughs> that sounds so weird, but that's what I do. My, it drives my wife crazy. I, I have this, I, my friend Jordan talks about this idea of a nap, being a non-anxious presence. I am the complete opposite of being a nap. I am complete anxious presence, and I just clean. What do you do when you feel out of control? Do you eat? What do you, what do, you do? What do you do? That's the question I want to ask. What do you do when you feel out of control? And then what did our Savior do when he felt out of control? Because believe it or not, in the midst of this crucifixion stuff, Jesus fell out of control too. So we're going to look at what he did. Let's pray together. Father, glorify your son again. Glorify your son again. Through the thousands and hundreds of thousands of churches that are streaming today, literally hundreds of thousands of churches are proclaiming the gospel all throughout the world today via online. God, thank you for that. Thank you for that. Thank you that in this crisis we've had to learn how to adapt. And for a good thing, glorify your son again today in 2020, the year of vision. We love you. God, I pray that through this message we would be able to provide hope, encouragement, and God, at the end, challenge. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So I do want to challenge you today. I'm not going to lie. Like, I literally do want to challenge you this morning. I feel like if we don't come to the scriptures and, and, and proclaim the gospel and we don't feel challenged, then really we haven't done our job. And again, the question that I'm asking today is, what do you do when you feel out of control? And really the better question is, was what did Jesus do when he felt out of control? And I turn, and you'll see it on the screen, Matthew chapter 26. It's the night before the crucifixion. It's right after uh, when Jesus does the Last Supper, and he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he says to the disciples, sit here and pray while I go pray. So he, he says to the disciples, sit here and pray while I go pray. He's going to go into the garden and pray. And in verse 38 of chapter 26, it says this, Then he said to them, the disciples, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch for me. So he gave them one task. Stay here and keep watch for me. Now it says in verse 39, going a little farther, he fell on his face to the ground and he prayed. This is his prayer. And this is what we really need to pay attention to. Listen to the prayer of Jesus when he felt out of control. My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken. He didn't want to go to the cross, y'all. Who would want to die for somebody else? 
He says, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me. And then this key phrase, yet, not as I will, but as you will. And uh, that's the key lesson that we need to take from this scripture today. When we ask the question, what do we, what do, we do when we feel out of control? Well, we need to do what our Savior did. Listen to this, what the Savior did. He said, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Now, focus. It says, now he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. This is Matthew chapter 26, verses 38 through 40. And, and here's what I want you to see. Not even Jesus at this time could control his disciples. So you, if the Savior can't control other people, you shouldn't feel bad if you don't feel in control either. So hear that. Even then, the, the, the Savior could not control these disciples to get what he asked them to do, which was to stay here and watch, to be on guard. Remember we talked about like, keeping your dukes up, stay, stay on guard? But even Jesus couldn't do that. So if Jesus felt out of control, let me know what you think here. Right? Yes. Right? No. Is it okay for you to feel out of control in the midst of all of this when you're sheltering in place, when you're, when you're uh, staying in your house for days on end, when every day feels like an endless day of Groundhog Day, when you do the exact same thing over and over with no change? Is it okay to feel like you're out of control? If the Savior even felt like he was out of control, is it okay for you to feel like you're out of control? For me, I say absolutely. It's okay. It's not about how you feel. It's how you respond. And so maybe you're like me, and, and in some senses you're grieving this idea of a, a sense of, of control, the fact that you can go wherever you want, whenever you want, the fact that you can go to the movies. But now we're seeing things like proms being canceled and graduations being canceled and weddings being canceled and sports being canceled and vacations being canceled and dinner plans with friends being canceled, family plan being canceled, parks. You can't even go to parks. Haircuts. I, I was grieving this morning, the fact that I can't get a haircut. I, I want a haircut so bad. And I got a question for you, if you don't mind. Just let me know. What's the hardest thing that you keep going or no? So what's the what's the hardest thing that you've had to give up so far? That's the question that I have for you today. What's the hardest thing that you've had to give up? And here's the idea that I want to press into with this idea is this idea that we have the illusion of control. And, and there's this thing called cognitive bias. And cognitive bias leads us to believe that we have control over outcomes when in reality we do not have. In essence, we overestimate the degree of control that we have in uncontrollable events. Let me say that again. We overestimate the degree of control we have over uncontrollable events. We can't control this at all. So be honest. Is this you? Are you a control freak like me? Are you a control freak like me? And here's what I'm learning, and I, and I really, really, really want to press into this. So I'd ask you to hear me right here. I'm a control freak. I'm going to admit it. I'm not going to sit here in front. I am a control freak, and here's what I'm learning. The more that I try to control, the more I'm afraid of losing control. The more that I try to control, the more I'm afraid of losing control. And the more that I'm afraid of losing control, the more I control. Let me say that again. The more that we try to control, the more we are afraid of losing control. And the more that we're afraid, the more we try. Now listen to the most powerful words that Jesus said as we go down just two more verses in 42 of chapter 26. He, Jesus after he saw these disciples and he, he confronted them, why can't you even sit here and stop and watch and pray? He goes back to pray again. It says he went away a second time and prayed. So this is the second time that he prayed. My father, if it's not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, your will be done. Your will be done. I'm trying to talk to all my control freaks out there. I'm trying to talk to all of those folks who feel like we can control situations. And I ask you to hear me here. You don't always have the power to control. But listen, please hear me. Please, please, please. But we always have the power to surrender. You don't always have the power to control. But we always have the power to surrender. 
And here on Easter of 2020, that is what I'm trying to call every single person that tunes into this message right here to truly 1,000% surrender to our Savior, that there is no partial surrenders. Would you say that phrase with me today? Would you write it in the comment box that you don't always have the power to control, but always have the power to surrender? Write that phrase. I always have the power to surrender. I always have the power to surrender. Now, you may be thinking, like, if I surrender, well, what happens if life doesn't go as I want it? So you're challenging your thoughts. You know, I, I want to surrender, but what happens if I surrender and life doesn't go as I want? A lot of people during this COVID crisis are asking questions like, did God cause this? Or is God allowing this? Or is God using this? And I'd love to know what you think. I'd love to know, like, if you don't mind chat typing, like, is God using this? Is God allowing this? Is God causing this? What are your thoughts there? I'd love to hear what you guys have to say. In reference to this COVID-19 crisis, is God using it? Is God allowing it? Or is God causing it? I'd love to know your thoughts. When we ask the question, where is God when we don't like what's happening in essence, what we're trying to say is, where is God when life is hard? Where is he when life is hard? Now, there were some researchers that did a research panel on younger uh, people, 30 and younger, on their faith. And what they found is that the majority of people that are 30 years old subscribe to a faith called MTD. MTD stands for Moralistic Therapeutic Deism. Moralistic therapeutic deism. Moralistic equates religion with being good, moral, and nice. Therapeutic means that faith is here to improve my quality of life, that the more that I participate in religion, the more that my life will get better, and then deism, which is God is real, but he's not really active. So 30 people, th people who are 30 years old and younger, they subscribe to this idea that a mostly uninvolved God exists to make my life better. A mostly uninvolved God, his only factor for existence is to make my life better. I know some people like that, do you? That God is here to serve me. Maybe you've seen the bumper sticker that God is my co-pilot. That is the essence of moralistic therapeutic deism. God is not our co-pilot. We are his co-pilot. We are partnering with him. He is in control. Now, this belief says here that my faith in God should help me to have a happy, healthy, comfortable, and more trouble-free life. Now, the, the problem is, now hear me here, if God wants me happy and I'm not, then God has failed. And there's a lot of people out there that's not happy. Does that mean that God has failed? And my answer to that is 100% unequivocally, absolutely no. Because I believe that God can use hard circumstances to make our lives better under this idea of perspective. But here's also what I realize that so many people that subscribe to this, they've tried church, they've tried prayer, they've tried religion, and none of this has worked. And I came to this conclusion last night as I was looking at my worship leader's Instagram post that he had staked that uh, trying Prayer, church, and religion without Jesus is like having A1 sauce with no steak. Can I get an amen? Like, who in the heck wants to just eat A1 sauce? Like, you need a good, juicy steak. And my friend Jordan made me so jealous with his steak last night. That's all I could think about. And here's what I'm trying to say, y'all. If all you have is church, all you have is religion, you are missing the point. Instead of trying this moralistic therapeutic deism that says that God exists to make my life better, we need to subscribe to one idea and one idea alone, the fact that Jesus Christ was crucified, buried, and resurrected, and my life exists to glorify him and him alone. Can I get an amen out there? That's what I need to surrender to today. Not my will, but his will. That Jesus died for me, but now this life that I live, I live for him. Jesus didn't die just so I could have a better life. Jesus died so I could have eternal life. That's where I need an amen right there. 
He's not here to make my life better. He's here to give me new life with him. Life forever. Now, maybe you're asking the question, well, what if I do surrender to God's will? What if I actually give a thousand percent to God and he doesn't make my life better? If I am still single in five years, if I get COVID and die, if I die of cancer, if my marriage doesn't get better, if there's a lockdown that goes all the way into the summer, if the economy slips into recession, if I lose my business. And here's what I want to say. And you can follow Jesus and check the box. You can pray God's will and check the box, and life is still going to be hard. I don't want to give you some false sense of security that by following Jesus that life is going to be all ice cream cones and sunshine. Because it's not. Because God uses the hard times to teach us eternal lessons. And if I can say this, and I think you should write this down, that God's will is rarely easy. But it's always good. Let me say that again. That God's will. His desire for your life. Is rarely easy. But hear this. Always. I looked up the word always in the Greek. And it means one thing. 100%. Always. God's will is always good. Rarely easy. But always good. How do you think that life should just be easy and good when you follow a Savior who was arrested, who follow a Savior who was beaten within an inch of his life, when you follow a Savior who was cast, hurled insults upon, that he hung naked on a cross, and realize, like seriously realize that in an instant God could have snapped his finger, taken control, snapped Five million legions of of angels to come collect him off that cross. But what did he do? Lean in right here. When life got hard for Jesus, what did he do? He surrendered. He said to the father, not my will be done, but your will be done. He said, it is finished and into your hands, my father, I commit my spirit. And again, let me say it. You don't always have the power to control, but you always have the power to surrender. And my question to you, not your neighbor, not somebody that you wish somebody was listening. My question to you is what do you need to surrender to today? What do you need to surrender today? God's will is rarely easy, but always good. And we follow the model of Jesus and he surrendered. God's will is not always easy, but it's always good. What do you need to surrender today? Is it a relationship? Is it your health? Is it your finances? Is it your future? Is it your job? Is it your kids? What do you need to surrender And let me present this last idea for you today. That there has never, ever been such thing as partial surrender. Nobody can ever say that I'm 87.5% surrendered to Jesus. You can't say to Jesus today that I, uh, I trust you with some things, but not all things. I trust you to save me, but I don't trust you with my kids. That I trust you to get me to heaven, but I don't trust you with my job or my health or my loved ones. And I need you to be honest. Can I, can I get up in your grill again? I, I need you to be honest with me here. As I talk to each and every one of you. Are you fully surrendered to Jesus on this Easter Sunday of 2020? Or are you just partially surrendered? As you look at what Jesus did, as you look at what he encountered, he looked at the father in the midst of his own pandemic. A crisis of belief. And what did he say? I wish this cup would pass from me. But if it is your will for me to drink of this cup of suffering, I will do it. And he went and said it again. Not my will, but your will be done. And the question that I'm asking is. Are you partially surrendered? Are you fully surrendered? 
Jesus said in verse 39, my father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And if I can say this, that real faith starts between the if and the yet. Again, let me read. My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Real faith starts somewhere between you saying, if God, and yet, if I get married, if you heal me, if you would allow me to have a job with benefits, if you would allow me to get into the college that I want to go to, but everything in our culture goes contrary to this. Our culture says you take charge, you take control of your destiny, you make it happen. But Jesus says this, if you cling to your life, you will lose it. But whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Please hear that. Whoever loses their identity for my sake will find it. Whoever loses their job security for my sake will find it. Whoever loses whatever they need to let go for my sake, they will find their life. They will find their identity. As here at Sojourner, we say they will find their life. They will find their purpose, and they will find their peace. Who out there today needs to surrender fully to him? Who out here today? Like, I'm asking. Like, this is the whole point of my message. Who out there needs to surrender to the will of the Father fully? Not partially, but fully. I'm asking you a legit question. I need you to not answer me, but I need you to answer God the Father. This isn't about me. This is about you and the Lord. This is between you and God. You know your heart and so does he. If he were to ask you, are you fully surrendered to me, what would the truth be? Not what would you like to say, not what would you want to say. What is the truth? Like this is black and white. This is yes and no. There's no if and and. Are you fully? Like all to Jesus, I surrender. Like, I'm asking that today. In this year, I don't think there's a better time to fully surrender your life to the will of the Father. Because surrender is not a one-time event, but surrender is a daily choice. And that God can do way more with your surrender than you could ever do with your control. Surrender is something that we do daily to Him, not one time. So I'm inviting every single person out there to pray with me. And the question that I have is not if you need to surrender. The question that I have for you is how do you need to surrender? Today, do you need to surrender for the first time to Jesus? Because I believe that there are some of you out there that are watching here today that for the very first time, you need to surrender your life fully to the one who gave his life for you. I also believe that there are uh, so many of us out there that, that go to church, that have tried religion, that subscribe to this moralistic, therapeutic deism, and we're not really surrendered to God does not exist for me, but I exist to glorify him. Some of you guys need to surrender to him for the first time in a long time. Is it A or is it B? I come. I, I wish I could sing, I surrender all. Like, that's what we need to say today. I sur- all to Jesus, I surrender. I surrender all. Would you pray with me? And I'm asking you a question. How do you need to surrender? Not if you need to surrender, but how. Father, to glorify your son in this moment would be a supreme, I want to say the word pleasure. Like, I want to glorify your son. And the only way that I know to glorify him is to, to uh, appeal, to beg God, to, to preach or whatever the words that you would like to use in this moment, God, for people to call on the name of your son. As he was high and lifted up, bleeding for my sake, to surrender my life to this risen Savior, risen on the cross, risen from the grave. 
How do you need to surrender today? Is it the first time? Is it the first time in a long time? Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for those who need to surrender today, that they would actually surrender. If you need to surrender to him, say these words, I surrender. I surrender. I surrender all. Father, we love you. It's in Jesus' name.
cry at eternity sure where death is just a memory and tears are no more we'll enter in as the wedding bells ring your bride will come together and we'll sing your beautiful oh. forward to the day when we can literally take that song and realize what it means in Revelation chapter 19 it says after I heard this the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting I can't wait till we worship again y'all till we can sing together and hear the voices of the multitude praise to our God and to all the servants who fear him both great and small Hallelujah for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the Lamb has come. And his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean. This was what was given to her to wear. Then the angel said to me, write, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. Blessed are those who are invited. And here's what I know, that God is inviting you today, inviting to you, and your RSVP is I surrender. And if today in any way that you surrendered, anyway. Literally begging you, begging you, begging you to click that link. Second thing, it's please share the feed to share the hope of the resurrection today. Every share gets five dollars. If you need prayer, if you need help in any way, there's also links in that description to contact us. We want to be here for you in this crisis. Please don't forget to tune in tonight. We got a new format this coming week for. We're also going to start a new series out of Peter called Dawn is Coming. Tune in with us. And again, one last time. He has risen. He has risen indeed. And we don't say that as cliche. We say that because it is the hope that every Christian has. Another execution. I love you. It's on the on the on the beginning part, and then I'm gonna close. But Sojo, like if you're Sojo, would you say I'm Sojo? Like, you know, that's Sojo life. <laughs> Please, I just want to let you know that I'm proud of you. I have literally watched over the last three, four, five weeks how you've loved one another. And so proud of you and I cannot wait to do it more but just hear me today on this Easter Sunday this day of celebration tell you I'm proud of you church I'm proud of us love you guys happy Easter we'll see you this Wednesday for Sojo Live God bless you <laughs>